Good afternoon, friends. Good afternoon. And a warm welcome to this afternoon session. It is a very special session. Our scriptures tell us Ajnana Timirandhasya Gyananjana Shadakaya Chakshurunvilitam Jena Tasmeshri Gurave The darkness of ignorance is dispelled with the light of knowledge, light of wisdom. And it is Guru who shows us that path and therefore with the salutations to the Guru we begin this session. The Guru comes in all forms. Sometimes it's in the wonderful form of a teacher that we have with us today which is Dr. Hegde, Padma Bhushan, Dr. B. M. Hegde. Uh, I invite our Managing Director, Mr. Rajiv Bajaj to say a few words uh, and address us. Sir, it's a great uh, pleasure and privilege to welcome you. Thank you very much for making the time. Friends, I'd like to start by reading a short introduction of Dr. Hegde. Dr. Hegde is a well-known medical scientist, educationist and author. He's a gold medalist from Madras University for his MBBS. He's an MD from Lucknow University. He received his FRCP from London and FRCPI from Dublin University. He was trained in cardiology from the Harvard Medical School. Through a distinguished career of medical practice and medical education, Dr. Hegde went on to become Vice Chancellor of Manipal University. He also heads the Mangalore chapter of Bharati Vidyavan. Dr. Hegde has authored several books. He is also a prolific speaker at various forums. He is also the editor-in-chief of the medical journal, the Journal of the Science of Healing Outcomes. Through his speeches and articles, he has stressed the need for urgent research to try and scientifically authenticate many of the inexpensive methods in other systems of medicine to put together a future system incorporating the best of all the streams. For his contribution to the scientific fraternity and society in general, Dr. Hegde has been decorated with many awards such as the Dr. B.C. Roy National Award in 99, the Dr. J.C. Bose Award for Life Science Research, an honorary PhD from Tirupati University and Pride of India Award from the Federation of Indian Association in North California. And of course, as Amru just mentioned, in 2010 he was honored by the Government of India with the Padma Bhushan, one of our highest civilian honors. So thank you once again. Dr. Sapa for coming to be with us. We have spent some time in the morning with him and already he said so many interesting things that I can tell you this is going to be a very interesting session. In fact, his whole emphasis was he doesn't have much to say. He wants to know from you what is on your mind and, and share his thoughts accordingly. And one of the comments he made was that, if I understood you right, sir, that uh, science is a lot of nice stories, one after the other, in a cumulative sort of fashion. And what a strange coincidence, because when I came to work this morning, and I wanted to put together a short presentation, just to set the context, that what is the connection between Dr. Saab and perhaps what we are trying to do here in this company. So I asked myself, how do I set the context? So I put together four or five slides, and I decided to call it short stories. So that's quite a coincidence. Now motorcycles and Ayurveda or any medical science may be thought to be two very different activities or endeavors. But as you all know well, we learn from such sciences like that of homeopathy or yoga and I'm sure today from the world of Ayurveda or medicine in general. And we learn not so much necessarily the details and the specifics, but the good principles. Because as Amrut said, nothing is more important in life than our wellness. Whether it is our personal wellness, the wellness of our family and friends, or indeed the wellness of our colleagues and our organization. So this is a very important aspect of our work. And so it doesn't matter whether you are passionate about motorcycles or Ayurveda, there is something that is common that we can distill out of it and learn from. So I'd like to share a few slides with all of you to set the context for today. 
but he'll explain. Speaking of passion, I read this a long time back. I'm sorry if uh, it's a little smaller than it should be. Benjamin Franklin said, if passion drives you, let reason hold the reins. And the way I translated it into my mind was that we are a company that wants to be the best motorcycle company in the world. And if ambition to be the best is what drives us, then reason or logic should hold the reins. Because unless we are proceeding on the basis of sound logic, we are not going to fulfill our ambition. I consider myself very fortunate because I met some people through my work here who I think helped me to understand a few things better so that we can do a better job. Many of you know these people. Starting with, I would say, Dr. John Wallace, who came to us in the 80s, 90s, and till about 10 years back. I would say he taught me, and I'm sure many of you, some very sound principles of management, beyond just manufacturing that he came to teach us, which have stood us in good stead. Yamaguchi-san, our manufacturing guru from Japan, he left many sound principles with us. More recently, Jack Trout, he taught us the real meaning of marketing. Dr. Rajan Sankaran, probably the best homeopath in the world. A lot of people think that he is the best homeopath in the world. He had a session here a couple of years back, you would remember. His teachings have left many sound principles or logic or good reason with us. Those of us who study or practice yoga, pranayam, Guruji, a younger, he was a, I would say, a tall embodiment of sound logic and its application. So we have, we have been very blessed that we have had such people amongst us. There are not too many of them, but we have managed to be associated with some. And I feel so proud and so fortunate that today Dr. Hegde is here because he is another tall figure, if I may say so, in just the world of reason, logic and how one can learn from these principles and apply them in our, in our life in a holistic sense. It's not a matter of personal life, professional life. I don't think life can be thought in these reductionist terms. Life is only one life and we should apply these principles holistically to that. I remember about 10 years back, as my interest in homeopathy and yoga grew, somebody asked me at a media function, that is it true that uh, homeopathy is your hobby? So I said, no. Actually, homeopathy and yoga is my passion. Only motorcycle is my hobby. I, I, I do something with motorcycles on the side. But my real interest uh, lies in areas like this, where one can really learn not only something new and different, but something sound. <clears throat> in the morning, in our discussions with Dr. Saab, Amrut brought up the name of Dr. Kent, the famous homeopath. And uh, I have said this more than once uh, from this place that one of the concepts of Dr. Kent that I like very much is his thought that we can choose to live in one of two worlds, the world of cause or the world of result. Like we say in our work also, good quality may be a result, but for that you have to address the root cause. So we also talk in terms of cause and result. Homeopaths also apparently think in terms of cause and result. Now the reason I mention this is because this is what Mark Twain said. The second day of our life, which is as important as the day that we were born, is the day we will understand with some degree of certainty that why we are born. So we are all trying to discover that in our own ways. For me, I think the interesting thing to know is not the world of result but the world of cause. Put in other words, 
people often ask what is more important is it the means which are more important or the ends are more important many people say means are more important because that's the good thing to say but in the end we are all preoccupied with the results with the ends i think means and ends in a way like dr sab just brought out in the context of the flowers one can correlate to the roots of the tree and the fruits of the tree so we must remember i think that roots is what is permanent the fruits are temporary they will come and go but if the roots are there and they are well looked after well nurtured the fruits are bound to come so we need not be in any confusion whether means are important or ends are important of course means are important of course cause is important if we address cause result will be addressed we can have that confidence of course the confidence comes as time passes and we are able to see that things work in that fashion in other words cause result means ends roots fruits in other words the solution does not lie at the gross end or the physical end or the material end of things the solution becomes clearer as you go more and more into the subtle side of things think about it in the context of our own work if we have a defect on a product that is a very physical thing like a symptom on our body but if we ask ourselves like we have a technique called why why analysis what is the root cause of this root cause of this root cause of this why this happened why this happened why this happened where do we land up ultimately we land up ultimately not in a physical area we land up in a area of understanding of training of education the operator was not given this training no training or education or knowledge or experience are not physical things they are subtle things so it is believed in homeopathy that problems also arise from what is subtle and solutions also arise from what is subtle because what is subtle is it is at our core in our center then as they progress further they manifest into the physical which are more easily perceived by most people so in this journey to go to the subtle to the cause is there a better way to do things we come to the concept of the life force or as we know called the immune system in allopathy or called the prana in yoga or chi in chinese all these entities are one and again to the best of my understanding these are also not material or physical or gross these are also intangible these are also subtle like all of you i am very very much looking forward doctor sir to listening to you well friends i learned a few points from rajiv's short stories because we all learn things from short stories only i'm telling you one thing i learned was strategy eats our culture eats strategy for lunch and according to him for lunch breakfast and dinner now i'll just tell you if you go deep into it what is culture culture is a very difficult term but do you know what culture is culture is what one does when no one looks at it Did you get it? <laughs> Strategy is the same. So it not but doesn't only eat uh, breakfast, lunch, and all. They are together all the time. They are a well knit family. Strategy and culture. So if you are a good cultured man, cultured man is called Arya. Arya. Arya is not a man who has come from the central India. Arya is a cultured man. When Arjuna puts the Gandhi bar down in the war, war front and tells Krishna, "I I can't fight. Who am I killing? My gurus, my brothers, my cousins." Then Krishna says, "Anarya justa o partha. You are not a good man because you promised your brother that you will fight, and because of you has come to the war. And now you say I am not fighting. Anarya justa o partha. A kirti param. You won't get kirti. A swargiam. You will never go to swarga. So remember, you are an Arya." You are a cultured man because you do what you say and say what you do. That's called walking your talk. And I have studied Raju, and he is a Arya. <coughs> Good boy. I like him because he loves homeopathy. I also love homeopathy. 
this various caste systems in medicine, allopathy, this pathy, that pathy. I tell my students, whether you practice allopathy, umapathy, ajurveda, ayurveda, homeopathy, as long as you practice sympathy and empathy, you don't have to worry about it. Today, that's exactly what we don't do. When the hospital started in the 18th century, anybody who went into the hospital went to heaven. It was called hospitalism. All because of the infection in the hospital. And the one who brought down this mortality from 100% to 40% was Florence Nightingale, who called herself, I'm the general of buckets, brushes, soap, bread, and bandage. All that she did was give them good food, tender loving care, and cleanliness. Mortality fell down. Now you talk of homeopathy, we have come back to that principle. In America, there's a Chinese doctor called Dr. Chan in the Johns Hopkins Hospital. She was a pediatrician and her children were dying like flies of simple infections by a simple germ which normally should not affect a human being called Clostridium difficile. Children were just flying, coming to the intensive care unit and dying. One day, she read a lot of Indian scriptures and in the Indian veterinary science, in the 17th century, a cow has a bad infection. The treatment was another cow's shit. Okay? But she said, why not I do the same thing? Children are anyway dying. So she took the mother shit of a child who is seriously dying and 250 cc of the shit, emulsified with water and put it through the rice tube into the pump, through the gut. And in four hours, the child was perfectly normal. Of course, they called it fecal transplant and it becomes respectable when it comes from America. <laughs> <laughs> if Muraji Desai drinks his own urine, he will say, hey, fool, he doesn't know anything. But if America says, come on now, take shit as the best treatment for infection, you will need to say yes. And in America now, you can get poop capsules, no poop capsules. If you want your immune system to be boosted, you buy poop capsules, five dollars a capsule. Only thing is, it's not yellow, that yellow part of the material they have removed, it's a shit tone. <laughs> so what I am telling you is, this is a big cycle, goes on and on and on. So nobody should pontificate to the world saying that what I think is the right thing. You know, without cholesterol, you can survive forever. With the cholesterol, you will die very soon. Very interesting thing, when I was a student, we were taught normal cholesterol must be about 250, milligrams. After I passed, 10 years later it became 200. Another 10 years it came to 180. The another 10 years it came to 160. And then the drugs started coming. From cholesterol in the 50s to statins in the 90s, 2000. And do you know the business? If I were to show you a graph, the death rate due to coronary artery disease was going up. And proportionately, the profit of the drug companies was also going up. You can extrapolate the two graphs, identical, absolutely parallel. <laughs> now they say, I have been saying cholesterol is a friend, more the merrier. If you want to live long, you must have good cholesterol. A study done in French nursing home showed, ladies above 90 had about 800, 900 cholesterol. Because remember, you, you kill billions of your cells every day. They have to be replaced. And new cell wall is cholesterol. And if you don't have enough cholesterol in your blood, the cell wall is so weak that it invites necrosis, which invites cancer. And I don't want to tell you more about cholesterol because if you don't have cholesterol, you die very young. Now America says cholesterol is very good. Have you seen last month's Times magazine? Bullseye, two bullseyes on the cover. They eat more eggs, eat beef, eat red meat. Try your things in lark. This is what used to happen when we were students in the West. We used to get onion rings. And those onion rings are so tasty. Yeah? Brahmins from here, they'll go and say that no, I'm a vegetarian, I'm only eating onion rings. One day I told him, do you know what it is fried in? <laughs> I said, it's lard. And he started vomiting. Then I told him, don't worry, you go back home, have a nice bath in Ganges, change your cross belt, you are fine. <laughs> Knowledge is not static. Wisdom can be static. What is the difference between the two? Knowledge dwells in heads replete with thoughts of other men. 
I read this in this book, I heard this, I this, this, I saw that, my teacher told me. But wisdom is something that is in your own head. So the poet said, knowledge and wisdom, far from being one, have nothing in common. Knowledge is so proud because it knows so much. No, I'm so and so, my CV, blah, blah, blah. And hum wisdom is so humble because it knows no more. Here was the wisest man in the world, born Jahanna Gerte, who said, I now know medicine, science, philosophy, physiology, jurisprudence, even as theology, from end to end with labor skin. But here I stand, O oh fool, with all my lore, no wiser than before. Did you understand? Yes. Now, Rath was telling me that you all want to know how to live happily, healthily, and never die. Nobody wants to die. <laughs> <laughs> For a minute, you think none of us dies. <coughs> Just think, hypothetically. Can you stay, sit in the room like this? You have to stand up. Even if you stand up, there is no space. Nobody dies. Then you have to develop some mechanism of sucking food from the feet. Even then, there will have no place. <coughs> Dying we must. But our aim should be, till we die, we don't know when and how. We must be independent. We should not be dependent on them. So, you don't want to be sick, right? So, I'll tell you some secrets of healthy living. Having said that, when you accept all that, I should also give you a rider. That in spite of all that, diseases can still strike you because this is an accident. But accidents are rare if everybody follows the traffic rules. <clears throat> so, if everybody follows the healthy rules, accidents are rare. And even if we meet with an accident, the accident is not very severe, you will recall. As Rajiv rightly said, God has made us. You know how long we have been in this planet? Nine billion years. And those 900,000 years, we have had no doctors. We have had no catheters, no angiograms, no patis, no nothing. There is a beautiful definition of health in Ayurveda, which is a positive definition. What does it say? Samadhatuhu samagnischa samadoshaha malakriya prasanna atma indriya manasvastai kevidiya. Put it in simple language. You get up in the morning, you want to work. Not that you have to work. There is a very big difference between you ask yourself in the morning, do I want to go to work or do I have to go to work? If the answer is I have to go to work, you are going there for salary. But if you want to go to work, that's your health. So, you work well, eat well, sleep well, shit well, piss well, love everyone, and don't hate nobody, you are absolutely healthy. Atma, Indriya, Manaha. When all these three are absolutely happy, you are healthy. So, we have now changed the definition of health from the Alma Atta definition to a new definition which the IOM, the Institute of Medicine in America has accepted. We now define health as enthusiasm to work and enthusiasm to be compassionate. Mark my words, only four words. What is enthusiasm? N in Latin means inside, Theos means God. So God sits inside and provokes you, prachodayat. That's what you say in the morning. That provocation comes. So, I want to work. I want to go to school. <coughs> How many children today want to go to school? <laughs> Parents drag them to school. Because every child is a genius to be converted into an idiot in school. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say that. If I said that, they'll kill me. Alexis Carroll said that in his book called Man the Unknown. Alexis Carroll was a surgeon who got the Nobel Prize for teaching surgeons how to stitch vessels. He got the Nobel Prize. It's, it's a good book. Read that for the good part. Of it. And he says, the important thing is, schools spoil us. <clears throat> and if you have not gone to school, you are a brilliant fellow. You are a scientist. You see a child is the best scientist. Have you seen that? You give the child a toy, it will observe it for four days. Observation. One of the three very important criteria of good science. Keeps it on the table in the right place. Then licks it for a few days to see if it has a taste. Use all the five senses. Then smells it. Then breaks it. That's a good child. That's a scientist. Wants to see what is inside. And that is science. Today, science's etymological root is not CA, which means knowledge, but ski cut into. 
and when you cut into you know what inside is so you don't have to have a checkup for seeing whether you're healthy or not you can check yourself up every morning only two questions you ask do i want to go to work today do i want to help somebody today do you know why you should help somebody because the scriptures have written that zakat islam says zakat help somebody Jesus says, it's not for thee alone, pass it on, pass it on. Charity is the essence of Christian. And the Isha Upanishad says, Tena, Dek Tena, Gunjita, rejoice in giving. That's not the reason. I'll give you a scientific reason. Evolutionary biology tells us that this world was run by germs for two billion years. Only germs. They remained here. They ran the world. And they were also like us competing with another doing business and who gets more profit, which hospital might make better profit, etc, etc. And they killed all of them. At the end they realized, if we go on competing like this, we will all be extinct. So they mutated. And what did they do? They created food for everybody, including you and me. What is that food? Chlorophyll. No scientists did that. Germs did that. They combined carbon dioxide from the atmosphere which they breathed out. They combined water vapor and sun's rays and got chlorophyll, the root of all food that you, are, you and I eat. Somebody may say, oh, what is this fellow talking about? I never eat chlorophyll. I eat only uh, the chicken in the morning and the fish in the afternoon and maybe goat in the evening. But even the chicken, goat and the fish depend on, on chlorophyll only for survival. Then what? They found something else happening, which is, which is happening today also. They produce a lot of oxygen by consuming this chlor uh, carbon dioxide. So they were poisoned by oxygen and they started dying with oxygen. You asked Dr. Grant when we were young, anybody who gets a heart attack immediately gets oxygen. In the cinema also you see a heart attack means oxygen. We have killed millions by giving oxygen and heart attack. <laughs> Today nobody gives oxygen unless you really have real hypoxemia. Oxygen is not good because oxygen provokes another heart attack or prevents remodeling. So you are hypoxia at that time. And that's why these germs learned a very big lesson that they should not survive in too much oxygen. Then they said, we must do something for others to survive. You know what they did? They donated a DNA, 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 DNA and made the first nucleated cell. First nucleated cell, two billion years later. And that nucleate is only you and me. That's called the zygote that you wear on the first day in your mother's womb. From there you have become now 70 kilograms, 60 kilograms. That day you know how, how heavy you are? 0 0.1201 gram. That speck of protein that day knew about all this universe, post-story and priori. That is called universal consciousness. A cell biologist who was studying this got so enamored he was an atheist, he didn't believe in God. Then suddenly he saw the cell coming to life. He said, my God. He didn't get out of the room for three days. He didn't eat, he didn't piss, he didn't shit. He was looking at the cell growing. His name is Bruce Lipton. He wrote a book for you. Please read it. It's called Biology of Belief. Biology of Belief. Bruce, Bruce, B-R-U-C. Lipton is T, Lipton, L-I-P-T-O. Fascinating book. Now what does it show? that we are here because of someone else's kindness. So what's your job? Be kind to others. That is why paropakarartam idam shari. An organization can work only when each one of us helps another person. If anybody in Prajaj Auto says, I run the Prajaj Auto, I am the CEO, I am the AFO, B, B, A, B, C, D, O. <laughs> organization is sick. I starts illness. When everybody in Bajaj Auto from Rahul Bajaj Ji to the PO say, we run the Bajaj Auto, we starts wellness. Bajaj Auto will be robust to good health. Did you understand that? Forget the word I, I. I is a very bad word. I is a very bad word. Ego, pride. And that's why, no. No. We. We means? We are all connected because we have come from the same consciousness. We are all fluid. You all look very solid, right? You look 70 kilos and very solid. There's nothing solid about you. You are all fluid. 
and the same lifting jump lepto cox in you and me are relatives, very close relatives. <coughs> My body cells, I have a 120 about. And they are cousins of Ravi's Ravi, Ravi, uh, body cells. How can I hate Ravi? The minute I hate Ravi and try to harm him, my cells get confused. Hey, what is this ass doing? What has gone wrong? He is hating somebody I love. And then after you keep on doing that, which people do, carry hatred. Hatred is a very heavy burden to carry. <coughs> the cells get confused and start hating your own cells. That is called autoimmune disease. Your cells, hating your own cells and killing your own cells. <laughs> now, why so many systems of medicine? Why have this caste system? We can put it together as a healing system. Modern medicine has something very interesting. Somebody gets a heart attack. If I get a heart attack, now God forbid, I have to go to Dr. Grant. Then whatever the Dr. Grant does, I have to accept because a doctor's, a patient's philosophy is listen to your doctor, right? So for an emergency quick fix, we need modern medicine, Western modern medicine. But what is the population? 2% of the sick population is emergency. So classify diseases on emergency basis, 2%. The minor illness syndrome basis, 50%. What are minor illness syndrome? <coughs> see, see, see. Coffee. Four things. Sore throat, common cold, feverish cold, flu-like illness. You know how many people suffer from that? Yesterday I was keeping account. Because four or six hours I was in the airport. And in the lounge, anybody who comes there, <coughs> and that's what. 55 million people don't go to work in Europe on a given day because of minor illness syndromes. How much? 55 million. Huge load. And what do we do today? <coughs> Every one of those people coughing in the airport, they would have taken antibiotics. If you take an antibiotic when you have a common cold or a viral disease, it changes your immune system, the, the cytokine response from Th1 to Th2. Which means, after taking antibiotics for a common cold for a number of years, like our children do, you become an asthmatic. So we are manufacturing asthma. You probably have not seen that. A study in Bombay showed that the children in five-star big hotels, I mean, the, the apartment, 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 you know what the apartment? Keeping people apart. <laughs> <laughs> Don't, they don't know who their neighbor is. Even if a neighbor dies, only when the smell comes after a week, you know that the neighbor is dead. And these apartments, vis-a-vis, -vis, children on the street, those children have called, the thing is coming out here, pus is coming out, and the child is going around playing the same thing. Ten times more asthma in the high-rise buildings compared to those children. Ten times more asthma. Okay, asthma is all right, you can say treat. You get TH2 will produce vasospasm. So you get a heart attack, much more heart attack. Common cold and antibiotic is one of the causes of heart attack, but we don't think about it. Very interesting. <coughs> but we do that. Instead of that, you say minor illness syndrome. What is the treatment? Best treatment is homeopathy. There are three studies on two drugs in homeopathy Aram trifilatum and Sambucus nigrae. Fantastic results. Two days, you're all right. But the latest research from Colindale, where it's a cold research center, common cold research center, started in 1948, closed in 1998 after 50 years, saying that we have not made any progress in common cold research. <laughs> Spent 500 million pounds, and they, we are converting this into AIDS research center. And the last paper said, if any one of you get cold next winter, go to an Indian restaurant and eat Indian curries. <laughs> Because the research showed ginger, garlic, and pepper in combination are the most powerful antiviral drugs man has ever known. Who does the study? In Harvard. <laughs> My granny did that study. <laughs> when I was a child, I used to get pepper. <laughs> That's what we drank. I'll tell you something very interesting how modernity comes. Our people think modern medicine was from America. No. Modernity in English simply means you improve your antiquity to modernity. Indian modernity. Garlic. There are 45 studies. 
We said garlic is useless. What did they do? Garlic pearls. What is garlic pearl? Garlic without SH group. Because nobody likes that smell. Especially girls don't like that smell. <laughs> without SH group, it's not garlic. And garlic to be garlic and to be medicine must be eaten raw in the mouth. When you mix it, the garlic gets mixed with the strychnin in your saliva. And the alanine in garlic becomes alicine, which is a medicine. A very powerful medicine. Much more powerful than your aspirin, tucramycin, your ticlopidine, and what have you. There is a very famous cardiac surgeon in New Zealand called Sir Brian Barrett Boyce. He had a large uh, chunk of Asian patients in those days. He used to tell me, Professor Rigde, I don't give the blood thinners for my patients after a viral replacement. Because they eat so much of garlic and onion, their blood is always thin. He was right. And mind you, those days, I'm talking of the 60s, we used to have cloth covered valves. If you don't give your warfarin, etc., the patient will die. But he never gave warfarin to Indian patient. The CAD audit now showed that if you lower your A1C level, the just the hemoglobin level, less than 6, you die very fast. Between 7 to 8, you live long. Beyond 8 also, you may die a little early. So, you must have higher sugar than what the doctor wants you to have. You are safer. And uh, uh, Dr. Grant will tell you after a heart attack, if you lower your sugar terribly, you will probably die faster. The heart likes little sugar, you know, it enjoys the sugar. But sugar as such is bad in the long run. But in the short run, hypoglycemia <coughs> kills more people than hyperglycemia. Similarly, 17 studies on hyper, high blood pressure treatment over the years showed that those who took tightly drugs, they met their maker a little faster than others. Now there is a long study, 25 year study called the MR fit study, multiple <coughs> risk factor intervention trial. <coughs> tightly controlled every so called risk factor, so called risk factor. The other side they just said do what you like. And after 25 years they found the, what you like fellows are still alive. And these fellows were all in heaven. <laughs> To see what happens to reassurance, we want so many systems, no? A very large study was mounted in Oxford, Cambridge, Hamburg and Munich. Severe cancer pain, severe pain. They ran a drip of morphia, the most powerful painkiller. But while running they said, this is not morphia, this is a new medicine we have found for cancer. It will not relieve your pain, but it will relieve your disease. Nobody's pain went. To be precise, 88% pain didn't go. Then they took the same patient, what's called the crossover study, ran a saline drip, salt water drip, and told the patient, this is the latest salt of morphia. Your pain will simply vanish. And pain vanished. They were shocked. Morphia in the vein, pain not gone. Salt water in the vein, pain gone. Then they repeated the study with fMRI, concurrent fMRI. See what's happening. When the patient believed that this is morphia, because he believed his doctor, believed faith, the forebrain produced such powerful opioids, more powerful than morphia, pain disappeared. When the patient didn't believe or believed the doctor that it's not morphia, the forebrain slipped and nothing happened. So treatment is not effective, but the faith is effective. Did you understand that? So what does it matter? What system you have? Homeopathy, allopathy, dhumapathy, whatever it is. Simply sympathy, <laughs> empathy, pain, which is called placebo in Latin. So make it a little more degree. You don't believe this, right, young lady? Write down the placebo effect. And you will know what is this happening in the world? Where am I? You know? This is very interesting. So, friends, what was the message that I want to send home? Your health is in your hands. Preserve it as long as you can. Did you understand? First go yes. to homeopath that company. <laughs> <laughs> Why I am saying this is, this is the reality. This is the reality. That's why I have a suggestion for, for, for Raju. All industries give their, uh, their workers and others money to go for a checkup. Checkup is the most dangerous thing that <laughs> the British Medical Journal has a regular checkup is
is the most dangerous activity that mankind can ever do. Because you get an incidentaloma by chucking up and it's called a cancer and you have given all cancer drugs and you meet your maker faster. In a way it is better. <laughs> Did you understand that? No, I'll tell you why. We don't have a definition of normal in statistical medicine. What we have is an average. Average is not normal, but we equate average with normal, which means we are taking the healthy population and applying this statistic. I'll tell you a very simple story. What is the normal height of an Indian male? We take 1000 males and the Gaussian curve, mean plus 2 standard deviation comes to 5.4. And then what we have done now, in society there are people who are 4.6, there are people who are 6.2 and there are 7.2 you know, fellows like uh, Kenneth Galbraith. Now all these are normal, mind you. They are all covered in this Gaussian curve. But when we cut it into mean plus 2 standard deviation, 90% are out. Now you send for a checkup. Amitabh Bachchan comes for a checkup. Or why? Raju goes for a checkup. <laughs> Raju goes for a checkup or his father goes for a checkup. 6.2. Ill. What is the treatment? Cut his leg. Make him 5.4. <laughs> okay. So you know or Jaya Bachchan goes for a checkup. 4.6. What's the treatment? Transplant her leg and make her 6.4. Can you believe that? This is exactly what we are doing. It's called false positives, false positive. That means every parameter that you check in the hospital, 25% of you will be false positive for one parameter. Today you go to a big hospital, they have got a total body scanner. 500 parameters are checked immediately. Trrr, it runs. And then you come with all such, my B12 is high doctor, my vitamin D is low doctor. My bone density is this doctor. My calcium is that doctor. But because one point this side, that side, you are told it's abnormal. And then, you know, one patient came to me, a rich man, but not, you know, English educated rich man. His ECG came out of the machine. These days, you know, ask your doctor Grant. His machine itself writes a diagnosis. <laughs> so the machine wrote borderline ECG. This man knew little English. So he said, doctor. My border of the heart is not all the way. <laughs> he saw four big hospitals for border, they have to check his border. Can you believe that? So you become a neurotic after that, you become a patient, either you become a patient or a permanent neurotic. A cardiac neurotic is worse than a cardiac patient. You can treat a cardiac patient but can't treat a cardiac neurotic. I can wake up a man who is sleeping, but if you say I am sleeping, I don't want to wake up, can I wake you up? <laughs> no, this is the problem. Our biggest problem now in medicine is anxiety neurosis. I tell you, how many people have anxiety neurosis? And we are very important doctors. We think the mind is in the brain. So we treat with the chemical drugs, mental disease. My brain is not in the mind. And what does a drug do? It damages the brain. So we get a zombie at the end of the day who is called Alzheimer's disease, another new disease. See? Isn't that good? And the professor of psychiatry in New York University, she wrote this book called Dementia, a drug in crime on mankind. Her name is Grace Elizabeth Jackson, lost her job, deported from America. But that book is getting her millions of dollars and she is very happy. She lives in Chile and goes around the world lecture. How many of you are taking a sleeping pill? Your sleep is not in the brain. But the pill damages your brain. How many of you are taking a waking pill? Why do not take a waking pill? Or at least you take a couple of eggs to sleep and another strong <laughs> cup of Kumbakonam coffee to wake up. <laughs> Kumbakonam coffee is very big. 650 milligrams of caffeine in that coffee. So you wake up in the morning. But look at those people sleeping on the roadside. Huh, what a beautiful sleeper. Yesterday, you know, I slept at 1.30 in the morning and I couldn't get sleep because I'm not used to sleeping. I was struggling to sleep and said, if I don't sleep now tomorrow morning, what will I do in Raju, Raju, Raju's place? What do I lecture now? And suddenly I thought, think of those as you as think of those people sleeping on the roadside. So happy and then I slept. 
because he was always think of people who are worse than you. You should not think of people who are look at him. He is, you know, sleeping eight hours. <coughs> I will never sleep. So compare yourself with the somebody who is below you and see how they live. I always tell people, you know, a lot of people are worried. They they are jealous of others. I have a simple formula for you to be happy. Don't be jealous of anybody. Supposing I see a big, let's say, Rolls Royce car parked on the road. I'm so jealous. I look this side, that side, nobody sees. I take a screw on this <laughs> A, jealousy is killing me. Scratching that will further kill me. On the contrary, I can wait for the owner to come. Let's say Dr. Grant comes and I say, Dr. Grant, what a beautiful car you have got here. Chah, the like of which I have never seen in my life. Dr. Grant's ego gets boosted. He says, if you want to ride in this car, I would love it. So he'll take you for a ride, you go around. And then while going, you simply boost him up. What a beautiful thing. It must be heavenly to drive this car. Would you like to try? So you get to drive the car, you get to ride in the car, maybe even a cup of coffee in Ruby Clinic. So all this is for what? For not hating Dr. Grant. For loving him. So don't you think love is a very good medicine? So what is the secret of uh, longevity? Universal compassion. What's the secret of good health? Helping others. Because the germs help you to be here and you help others to live here. So it's very simple, isn't it? So I don't want to talk anything further. I have not given you any medicines, any medicines or any pills. I have given you the strongest pill. <clears throat> have a clear mind. Where is the mind? Where is the mind? Never mind. <laughs> What is matter? No matter. Science is not the true thing in, in life. Reality is the true thing. Reality is far removed from science. Science is an establishment. I always tell people, do you know how to be healthy and happy? If I am a monkey and I know I am a monkey, I accept I am a monkey, I am absolutely happy, no stress at all. <laughs> Supposing I am a monkey, I know I am a monkey, but I behave like a tiger in society. <laughs> Just every second because where is my monkeyness seen outside? Did you understand that? That is why now I come back to motorcycle. Motorcycle has two wheels now. The world can run on two wheels. What are the wheels? Satyam, Brihadrita Mukram, Vishwam Dharayan. World runs on two wheels. Satyam, truth. Ritam, ethics. Brihadrita, high ethics. Mukram, applied sternly. So, Raju. You are a good boy, continue to be a better boy and the best boy you will be and your industry will prosper so well if it is ethical. Industry must be ethical, otherwise it is a curse on mankind. Industry can be a curse, but ethical industry is a big blessing. So may Bajaj Industries, Bajaj Auto become, you know, in various things, be one of the best industries in India and may shine till the sun and the moon set and let all of you love one another. And life running on love is something which is so fascinating. And charity is doing a lot of charity. Charity is a very important part because you have acquired wealth from society. You owe it to society, the wealth you back. And all the Westerners, the other day, the chief of that, what is that? Whatever. He gave 900 million dollars for charity. <coughs> Alfred Nobel was the biggest man who made money by dynamite. One day his factory went up fire. But Alfred had gone to the bank five minutes before that. So the whole world they thought Alfred is also dead. So the local papers wrote an editorial the next day. The man who made his millions by killing others is also consumed in the same fire. Very good lesson for you. And who was reading the paper? Alfred himself. <laughs> so he went to his lawyer. His wealth was 550 million Swiss francs. Gave everything to form the Nobel Foundation. So charity is good. Love is good. And equality, equanimity, all this come together. So at the end of the day, my message to you is love one another. Live like a large family. You will live forever. Thank you. I have no words. I am sure many of you also don't have words. There was one quote 
that we had read some time back of John Ruskin that when love and skill combine, expect a masterpiece. So this talk by Dr. Hegde was one such masterpiece. In our own journeys towards health, towards spirituality, perhaps this will stand out as a beacon and will continue to inspire us. Thank you.